Hello, and welcome to NTD News Today. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at our top stories. Senators vote to raise the debt limit temporarily and prevent the government from defaulting. What's next? And are they just kicking the can down the road? Analysis shows Biden's child tax credit will benefit blue state families more than red state families. That's because it's calculated based on different child care costs and the median income in each state. The House holds a hearing on the Arizona election audit. A Republican representative from Arizona says they do not know who won the 2020 presidential election there. He says though the recount numbers are similar, the audit showed a lot of issues. And efforts are growing to protect troops who reject the COVID-19 vaccine. Two senators say they'll try and prevent the Pentagon from dishonorably discharging those troops. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Attorney General Merrick Garland, and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas are in Mexico City. They're meeting with their Mexican counterparts to discuss a new security agreement. It's called the U.S.-Mexico Bicentennial Framework for Security, Public Health, and Safe Communities. The agreement aims to coordinate security measures between the two governments. Dialogue between the officials will work to address the factors that create security challenges across the border. The U.S. is concerned with drug trafficking from Mexico, while Mexico is frustrated with firearms crossing over from the U.S. The talks represent a return to meetings between White House officials and Mexican leaders after an earlier suspension. From deadlock to deal, we take a look at the Senate's short-term agreement to increase the debt ceiling for several weeks. Eleven Republicans broke ranks to vote with Democrats so the deal could move forward. NTD's Jessica Beatty reports. The Senate's paved the way to avoid the first potential default in American history. It voted late Thursday to approve a short-term increase to the debt ceiling. On this vote, the yeas are 50, the nays are 48. The deal between Senate leaders calls for increasing the borrowing cap by $480 billion. That's how much the Treasury Department told Congress it needs to get to December 3rd of this year. Eleven Republicans joined Democrats to break a filibuster on the agreement to raise the debt ceiling which allowed the final vote. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham told Fox News he's unhappy they folded. Well, we screwed up. Uh, For two months, we promised our base and the American people that we would not help the Democratic Party raise the debt ceiling so they could spend three and a half to five trillion dollars through the reconciliation. At the end of the day, uh, we blinked. Although some Republicans helped move it past the filibuster, none of them voted yes to raising the borrowing limit. After the vote, Democrat Joe Manchin said he thinks the Senate will eventually work it out. Everybody together and uh, understand that it's for, best for both sides. You can fight about a lot of things, mm-hmm. but you don't throw this out. This is the most serious thing that we can do, and we're not going to do it anymore. But Democrat Chris Coons is less optimistic. He would have preferred a longer-term solution. It means, unfortunately, that we will be right back here in two months needing another vote configured exactly like tonight's vote in order to raise or suspend the debt ceiling going forward. The White House says the short-term deal is a move in the right direction. This is a positive step forward, uh, the debt ceiling uh, short-term deal that we're seeing, and it gives us some breathing room. Next, the House will also have to approve extending the debt ceiling. They're set to vote on it Tuesday. Once approved by the House, it'll be sent to President Biden for his signature. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. President Biden plans to make the child tax credit permanent as part of the $3.5 trillion spending package, but an analysis shows that the savings wouldn't be spread equally across families in the country. They benefit families in blue states more than those in red states. Under Biden's proposed child tax credit, blue state families get on average 52 percent more savings than red state families. A family of four with one infant living in any of the 25 states that voted for Biden will get on average $12,000 in savings, while families in the 25 states that voted for Trump will receive an average of under $8,000 in savings. The figures come from data provided by the House Education and Labor Committee and analyzed by the Epoch Times. The House Education Committee calculated the figures based on average child care costs and the median income in different states. Under the Build Back Better Act, families making 100 percent of the state median income would pay no more than 2 percent of their income on child care. The child tax credit was first approved in the $1.9 trillion stimulus package. Now Biden wants to make it permanent in the $3.5 trillion spending bill. 
Executive Director of the Heritage Action for America, Jessica Anderson, told the Epoch Times, once again, we are reminded that Biden's economic agenda picks winners and losers. Public support for making the tax credit permanent is weak. Only 17 percent in a recent poll say they definitely support it, and 18 percent say they probably support it. In comparison, 34 percent say they definitely don't support it, and another 18 percent say they probably don't support it. And Democrat senators yesterday insisted that the Build Back Better bill include all of their green energy programs. Senator Ed Markey, a Green New Deal advocate, tells NTD tax breaks are the key to promoting energy reform without relying on China or Russia. NTD's Melina Weiskopf reports. Senate Democrats are working to push Biden's Build Back Better agenda with all of the clean energy projects included in it. Now, this comes after moderate Democrat Senator Joe Manchin earlier this week said he wants natural gas to be a part of this plan. But some of these Democratic senators say they're not going for it. They want to keep Biden's plan as it is and not make changes to it. It's not a moment where you can just say we're going to do one piece of this and not another important piece. Taking strong action on climate is a moral imperative, but we also understand that it is an economic imperative. No climate, no deal. Now, some people say that in order to enforce this clean energy plan, it will make us more dependent on foreign nations. For example, China dominates the clean energy market. Senator Ed Markey explains to us his proposal for how we can enforce these clean energy plans while at the same time being energy independent. To make the solar panels, we need to rely on the rare earth minerals. Do you think that we can make it easier in the U.S. to, to mine for those? Yes, we can. We, we, we have to find a way of moving from mining for fossil fuels to mining for rare earths. And we can do that in the United States and then move over uh, one group of miners into uh, the new work uh, place, the, the new kinds of minerals we need for our country for the 21st century. We can do this very, very rapidly. Uh, uh, as long as we set the policy, make it clear, the investors will move in uh, and they will see uh, that there is money to be made. Markey and other Senate Democrats want to pass a new law to give tax breaks to U.S. manufacturers who produce solar panels and windmills. Senator Wyden, chairman of the Finance Committee, has pushed for changes in tax policy, rewarding those who work toward clean energy goals. If you can reduce carbon emissions, you get the savings. So it is a tech neutral, no mandates, essentially free market approach. But the cost is part of what's holding back Senators Manchin and Cinema from supporting the bill. A solution offered by Senator Van Hollen is a polluters pay climate fund. It would assess the top 30 polluters and charge them a fee. That money would then pay for these clean energy plans. Democrats now working on negotiations to finalize a deal within their party and pass Biden's agenda. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. The Agriculture Secretary tells House lawmakers his department has received hundreds of comments in response to plans to invest $500 million to boost competition in the livestock industry. We know that there is a high concentration in this industry. We know that it, it creates capacity challenges, especially in beef, and there is a need for additional capacity. That's one of the reasons why uh, we began the process of establishing a $500 million fund. Uh, we have solicited information and input uh, from those who are interested in potentially utilizing this fund. The money is meant to expand meat and poultry processing capacity. The program was launched after President Biden's executive order early this year promoting competition. The aim is to build a more resilient supply chain and better food system. The $500 million are available in federal funds under the administration's American Rescue Plan. Another $100 million are available in loan guarantees. Vilsack says the goal is a better balance between supply and demand and between processing capacity and competition. He says the department is anxious to have fair prices for producers and a fair deal for consumers. The House Oversight Committee held a hearing on Arizona's election audit yesterday. The committee questioned Maricopa County supervisors, and a Republican representative from Arizona says they don't know who won the presidential election in Arizona, citing issues with the election, according to the audit. The audit of the 2020 presidential election in Maricopa County, Arizona, found just about the same number of votes for President Biden as the machines tabulated. 
However, U.S. Representative Andy Biggs from Arizona says they still don't know who won the election, pointing to many irregularities that the audit shows. He had a stiff exchange with Congressman Jamie Raskin. Do you accept the? Uh, do you accept this audit, which showed that Joe Biden won, and indeed by more votes than? That is not what the audit concluded, Mr. Raskin. You know better than that. Have you read the whole audit, or you cherry picked the line which talks about the recount versus the tabulation machines? That we would have expected to be very similar, and it was. And so anything that might have inured to who President who Biden's won the effect is my question, Mr. Biggs. I'm happy to yield to you for that. Who won the election in Arizona? Donald Trump? We don't Trump. know, because the, as the audit, it demonstrates very clear, clearly, Mr. Raskin, there are a lot of issues with this uh, election that took place. In late September, Arizona lawmakers were told the audit uncovered inconsistencies in the Maricopa election. Arizona Senate President Karen Fan raised concerns over signature verification on ballots, accuracy of voter rolls, securing of election systems, and record-keeping of evidence. For an unknown reason, the CEO of Cyber Ninjas, who conducted the audit, did not appear at the House hearing. Instead, the committee questioned Maricopa County Supervisors Bill Gates and Jack Sellers. If you were in Arizona politics in November of 2020 and didn't understand how Maricopa County was running elections, then you just weren't paying attention. The Maricopa County election officials responded to some of the claims of irregularities in the audit, but little attention was given to the actual claims in the hearings, with Republicans and Democrats mostly just repeating their talking points. The Arizona audit has been criticized for being a sham partisan review, while Republicans have said that audits should be a welcome part of confirming elections, with Texas announcing they're going to do an audit similar to Arizona's in four of their large counties. The hearing lasted over three hours, but no members seemed to change their stance on the election or the audit. A Virginia county votes to ask the state's governor to waive the witness signature requirement for mail-in ballots. The requirement would affect next month's gubernatorial election. Not all lawmakers agree with the request. The Fairfax County Board's only Republican supervisor cast a lone vote against the motion. He described the proposal as a blow to election integrity. The board's chairman says waiving the signature requirement would prevent a rise in COVID-19 infections. The requirement was also waived during the November 2020 election, but Supervisor Pat Harrity says witness signatures are an important line of defense against voter fraud. He also pointed out that early voting has already started and that it doesn't make sense to drop the requirement at this point. It's not clear if Democrat Governor Ralph Northam will support the measure. His office didn't respond to the Epic Times request for comment. Fairfax County still has a state of emergency in effect. Two senators are trying to stop the Pentagon from dishonorably discharging certain military members, those who declined the COVID-19 vaccine. It's unclear if the Pentagon will do so, but the White House says it's against the effort. Senators Roger Marshall and James Langford announced the plan on Wednesday, saying they'll try again to bar the Pentagon from dishonorably discharging service members who refused the COVID-19 vaccine. They'll do it by introducing an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act. The Senate will vote on the act later this month. Marshall explains what a dishonorable discharge means for troops. He says you're never going to be able to get a job again. You're going to lose your Second Amendment rights. They're going to take away your VA health care benefits and your education. The Pentagon didn't explicitly say that troops declining the vaccine will face dishonorable discharge. When asked about it in a Senate hearing, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said that taking a vaccine is a requirement. I'll just leave it at that. But the White House said in a statement late September that they strongly oppose congressional efforts to bar those dishonorable discharges. Lankford says he's spoken with the military and different branches seem to treat the issue differently. The Army told him they won't give a less than honorable discharge, but the Navy and the Air Force told him they may possibly give a less than honorable discharge. Undercover journalists spoke to Pfizer scientists who said natural immunity is likely better than the vaccine. And a whistleblower reveals emails from top Pfizer officials that show they don't want the public to know aborted fetal tissue is used in the development of the vaccines. What the vaccine is, is like I said, that protein. Undercover journalists working for Project Veritas spoke with three Pfizer scientists. The scientists gave out information that goes contrary to seminars the company requires them to take and that they're not allowed to discuss in public. Experienced Pfizer biochemist Nick Carl shares his viewpoint on the company's vaccine. When somebody is 
naturally um, immune, like they got COVID. Um, they probably have better, like not better, but more antibodies against the virus. So your antibodies are probably better at that point than the vaccination. Carl says that's because the vaccine is just one antibody against one specific part of the virus. But when someone contracts COVID-19, their body produces antibodies against multiple pieces of the virus. A senior associate scientist says natural immunity probably lasts longer than the protection from the vaccine. You're protected most likely for longer since it was a natural response. He went on to say that Pfizer is basically run on COVID money now, and they are not to talk about anything that could implicate big pharma. Another scientist echoes this. We're like bred and taught to be like, like vaccine is safer than, than actually getting COVID. You cannot like talk about this in public. What's more, Project Veritas interviewed a 10-year Pfizer employee and now whistleblower, Melissa Strickler, who reveals emails from high-ranking officials. She shares one from Vanessa Gelman, the senior director of worldwide research at Pfizer, about the use of human fetal tissue in vaccine testing. From the perspective of corporate affairs, we want to avoid having the information on the fetal cell lines floating out there. We believe that the risk of communicating this right now outweighs any potential benefit that we could see, particularly with general members of the public who may take this information and use it in ways we may not want it out there. We have not received any questions from policymakers or media on this issue in the last few weeks, so we want to avoid raising this if possible. Strickler said she's a little anxious about what Pfizer might do to her or say about her for revealing this, but to offset the risk of losing her livelihood and potential legal battles, she has a Give, Send, Go account where she's raised over $145,000. Pfizer did not immediately respond to NTD's request for comment. The Utah governor says the Biden administration will restore the boundaries of two national monuments. Their perimeters were reduced during the Trump administration. Former President Trump cut the size of the two monuments at the request of Utah Republican lawmakers. Two million acres were freed up, allowing the land to be used for ranching, drilling, mining, and other development. Native American tribes in the region consider these areas sacred. They want the Utah governor to have Biden restore even more of the land under national monument status. Grand Staircase Escalante was established as a national monument by former President Clinton in 1996. President Obama established Bears Ears National Monument in 2016. Under the Antiquities Act, presidents have the authority to create or alter national monuments. Still to come, items belonging to notorious Chicago gangster Al Capone go up for auction, including guns, jewelry, furniture, family photographs, and other personal effects. All that and more here on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Why could gold and silver prices be headed much higher? The Fed keeps printing more money. The dollar is getting weaker and weaker. And now we have the threat of rising inflation. How can you protect your hard-earned savings? In an environment of, of high degrees of uncertainty, much higher levels of volatility, I think you're gonna see a, a bigger gravitation towards the idea of ownership of gold. Plagues and wars and regime, regime changes, the gold and silver have uh, held their value through all of that and more. What you really need to do, get yourself some real, genuine protection 
that can be found in Precious Metals. Call for these special reports and Precious Metals Guide. Find out how high massive money printing and inflation could send gold and silver prices. I think gold and silver will win big. When you call, ask how you can get $5,000 in bonus gold or silver. Call 800-960-3100. 800-960-3100. Tesla is moving its headquarters from Silicon Valley to Austin, Texas. CEO Elon Musk shared the news at a shareholder meeting. The move comes as no real surprise. Musk has been building a factory in Texas for more than a year. His aerospace company, SpaceX, is located in Texas, and he recently began residing in the state. Also, Musk was very critical last year about California's strict COVID-19 shelter-in-place measures. Musk said his electric car company will continue to operate in Palo Alto, California, and even increase production there. A new report says inflation is costing the average American household an extra $175 a month. Gas, food, energy, transportation, it's all more expensive. NTD's Phil Zoe has more. Prices have gone up for many things, from meat to milk to this bag of chips right here. Inflation is up 5%, and Americans are spending on average $200 more per month. So what is going on? Uh, We did a recent survey. We found that about 9 in 10 Americans have noticed higher prices this year. We're seeing the strongest inflation in more than a decade. At a local shop in downtown Manhattan, the manager says everything has gone up. Prices went went up like 20 to 30 percent. Beverage prices, like especially Coca-Cola, they raised like $3 per case. But higher prices aren't the only problem. Six, seven months I've been looking for employees Mm -hmm. and I called all the agencies, but there's nobody seems to be willing to work. Debt relief attorney Leslie Tame is busy helping both businesses and consumers. The fact that expenses have gone up so much that they can't keep up with the regular bills. Her phone has been ringing off the hook. Yes, business has been so busy lately. We have really exploded, I would say, in the last six months, especially on the small business side. Around 27 million American households say it's getting very difficult to pay daily expenses. That's up 8% from two months ago. Phil Zoe, NTD News, New York. The U.S. Mint has announced the full list of five pioneering American women who will be immortalized in American currency. In the first run of the American Women Quarters program, images of the women will appear on the backs of select quarters beginning in 2022. They represent a wide array of professions and landmark achievements. Astronaut Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, plus poet and civil rights activist Maya Angelou were selected earlier this year. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen chose the rest of the honorees with input from the public. Asian-American actress Anna Mae Wong, Cherokee Nation leader Wilma Mankiller, and suffragette and politician Nina Otero Warren will also be featured on the coins. George Washington's facade will remain on the head side of the coins. The U.S. Mint will continue the program until 2025, honoring five women with five quarters each year. The Blue Angels have arrived in California's Bay Area this year ahead of the Columbus Day weekend where they perform air shows annually. They're debuting a new aircraft for its 75th anniversary, and the pilot is a California native. NTD's Eileen Ng has more on the ground. It's the Blue Angels' 75th anniversary, and two new aircrafts are debuting, the FA-18 Super Hornet and the C-130, also known as Fat Albert. Rick Rose, a major in the U.S. Marine Corps, flies Fat Albert for the Blue Angels. He's from Napa, California. He's been flying since 2014 and joined the Blue Angels two years ago. Fat Albert's kind of the Marine representation on the, on the U.S. Navy Blue Angels squadron, so it's a joint Marine-Navy squadron. And then being a pilot to kind of represent that in addition to the C-130 community in the Marine Corps, it's a very special community. It's a small community, but what we do is just the roles we play and the missions we, we do throughout the world are so, so important for, for Marines. But uh, being a pilot on this aircraft is nothing short of a, an incredible experience every day. Even though the shows were canceled last year due to the pandemic, Rose said they still practice at their home base in Florida and other Navy air stations. Rose said he's humbled to be back home to show Northern California what they can do. 
Uh, coming full circle when I was a kid, watching the Blue Angels perform at the Bay Area was a special thing for me. And I never thought in a million years I'd be now in the show performing, doing the same thing, inspiring uh, future generations, just as I was, you know, that kid. Fat Albert does not have the typical Blue Angel sleek build, and it can't match their speed, but it is still capable of doing all the stunts. This is also Fat Albert's 50th anniversary. It's the first year the J model debuts, with six-bladed propellers, upgraded engines, and avionics. For each show site, we'll carry the whole complement of six pallets of maintenance cargo, in addition to about 49 sailors and Marines that are back there. So uh, we're the logistics and platform to, to carry everything we need in order to make the show happen. And uh, so, you know, getting six jets in the air is kind of surface level of what really, all the teamwork that goes into making this happen. And uh, we carry the, the sailors and Marines that fix the jets and make sure that they're putting on a good show for us. The support team plays a big role in getting the aircraft off the ground and the show going. Uh, challenges are probably going to be long working hours, um, uh, gripes on the jet that are difficult to figure out. Um, but when we all get together and uh, put our brains together, we figure it out. Because it's a hand-selected process to be part of the team and many want to join, Donaldson said it's the best close-knit family and the teamwork is incredible. The Blue Angels will be heading to Loveland, Colorado next. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. Items belonging to infamous Chicago gangster Al Capone go up for auction Friday in Sacramento. One of his surviving granddaughters hopes some of the pieces show another, more human side of the organized crime boss. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the details. On Christmas Day in 1946, notorious Chicago gangster Al Capone took his wife and four granddaughters out for a walk. They went out onto the dock of their sprawling mansion on Palm Island, Florida. A picture shows Capone relishing his freedom with his family after his release from Alcatraz, where he served seven and a half years for tax evasion. The photo is of my grandparents. My youngest sister, Papa, is holding my youngest sister. And my older sister, Ronnie, is in front, and I'm right next to her. I was the second oldest. That picture is among 174 items belonging to the Capone family that will go up for auction in Sacramento, California on Friday. This picture was the last one that was taken before he passed away. He died a month later, January 25th. The items include personal photographs, firearms, pocket watches, jewelry, and furniture. Al Capone's platinum and diamond Patek Philippe pocket watch is listed for $25,000 to $50,000. His favorite Colt 45 pistol is estimated to auction between $100,000 to $150,000. The items that generate the most interest are the ones that you think of synonymous with a figure, a gangster figure like Al Capone, his guns and his fancy flamboyant jewelry. Nearly 1,000 bidders have registered for the auction from every state and 11 countries. Diane Capone said she hopes these items will reveal the human side of her grandfather, in contrast to his infamous legacy as a violent gangster. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A U.S. Navy submarine hit an object while submerged in the Asia-Pacific region on Saturday, but the incident did not result in any life-threatening injuries. The Navy says the USS Connecticut's nuclear propulsion plant and spaces were not impacted. It added that the submarine is in a safe and stable condition. Fewer than 15 people suffered minor injuries like bruises and lacerations. It is unclear so far what the submarine hit. Taiwan's president says they are not seeking military confrontation, but that they will do whatever it takes to defend their freedom. That's as tensions rise between the self-ruled island and its mammoth neighbor China, a strain that's sparking alarm around the world. Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen on Friday had tough talk for Beijing after a recent surge in Chinese aircraft flying into the island's air defense zone. Taiwan does not seek military confrontation. It hopes for a peaceful, stable, predictable, and mutually beneficial coexistence with its neighbors. But Taiwan will also do whatever it takes to defend its freedom and democratic way of life. 
Taiwan has been seeking the support of other democracies as a standoff with China worsens. This week, it's hosting a group of French senators and former Australian leader Tony Abbott. Beginning last Friday, around 150 Chinese warplanes, a new high in cross-strait tensions, flew sorties near Taiwan. Although that appears to have ended, Taiwan has complained of activities like that for more than a year, calling it grey zone warfare. Taiwan says that's designed to wear out the island's armed forces and test their ability to respond. China claims Taiwan as its own territory. The self-ruled island is seeking a bump in its defense budget over the next five years, mostly for naval weapons. And now, sources told Reuters, small numbers of U.S. Special Operations soldiers have been rotating into Taiwan to train Taiwanese forces. They declined to say how long this had been going on, but suggested it predated the Biden administration. The Wall Street Journal also published details on the training, citing unnamed U.S. officials on Thursday. The Pentagon, which in the past hasn't disclosed details about U.S. training or advising of Taiwanese forces, did not comment on the deployment. The Beijing Winter Olympics is less than four months away, but there's growing opposition to China's holding the Games due to its human rights abuses. Let's take a look at the latest of those protests in Germany this week. Around 50 Uyghur and Tibetan activists in Munich are protesting German company sponsorship of the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympics this week. Asghar Khan, head of the Eastern Turkestan Union in Europe, says a country which stamps on human rights and commits genocide must not be allowed to host the Olympic Games. Big international companies, such as Allianz or Siemens, should not act as China's sponsor and support it. Otherwise, they imply Western democracies or companies from Western democratic countries support the Chinese regime's acts. The Chinese regime has put an estimated 1 million Uyghurs in arbitrary detention in Xinjiang. They make up the Muslim ethnic minority group there. People are being arrested haphazardly. Women are being sterilized by force. Children are being separated from their parents. Here's what a camp survivor told CNN in a recent interview. The Chinese regime accused him of separatism and took him away from his Uyghur language kindergarten, where he works as a teacher. Uh, put the black hood on my face and they put me in a, the, this is the interrogation room. And inside the iron cage, there is a tiger chair. Your like uh, wrist shackled there and your like uh, feet also shackled. The former detainee said prison guards ordered other prisoners to rape him on the first night. And here's what a former Chinese police officer who had been sent to work at a Uyghur detention facility told CNN. How were the interrogations being conducted? Beat them. Kick them. Beat them bruised and swollen. Knock their heads on the radiator. Police would step on the suspect's face and tell him to confess. The former cop revealed some detainees were as young as 14, and all of them have been beaten, including women. He was ordered to arrest hundreds of Uyghurs and would face consequences if he didn't meet his quota. How many of the people that you arrested in Xinjiang do you think were actually violent extremists? None. None? Um. Xinjiang is not a war zone, and those people are our fellow citizens, not foreign enemies. The man admitted that police officers use electric batons to shock prisoners. But the Chinese regime denies that human rights abuses are taking place in Xinjiang. Overseas Chinese conmen are using dating apps to scam money from mainland Chinese citizens, and Chinese authorities are using draconian measures to crack down on them, like demolishing their houses back in China. And today's Tiffany Meyer has more on the story. Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping is reportedly trying to crack down on overseas Chinese con men. These con men are using dating apps to deceive people looking for a relationship and scan them into making investments. There are tens of thousands of these kind of scammers. It seems Xi Jinping is not happy about this sort of thing, and he is employing draconian measures to bring an end to it. Police stations are asking these scammers to return to China. They are threatening to demolish their homes in China if they don't come back, and have even threatened their relatives' homes. What's more, their children would be prohibited from going to school. And it seems these tough measures may be working. More than 50,000 scammers have returned to China this year. Chinese tech giant Huawei has hired a former BBC executive as its editor-in-chief. 
The U.S. has banned the controversial producer of telecom equipment over national security concerns and the company's ties to the Chinese military. Now Editor-in-Chief Gavin Allen was previously in charge of some of the most influential news programs in the U.K. and part of the upper management of British state media, the BBC. Allen announced his new position on LinkedIn, writing in a post that he was hugely proud to be joining a company that was a creative force for good. Huawei has been ramping up efforts to hire foreign talent, this as it's been facing U.S. pressure and suspicion from other countries. Some worry that if Huawei builds their 5G infrastructure, it might allow the Chinese regime to spy on them. Last time Huawei's recruiting made international headlines, it hired a renowned French mathematician to work at its research center in Paris. A recently published report by a French military think tank accuses the company of trying to influence Western politics by sponsoring political parties and hiring well-connected foreign officials. Up next, a new documentary depicts the 2018 rescue of a Thai soccer team from a flooded cave a trauma that united people across the globe and garnered worldwide attention. That and more after the break. I will bless those who bless you. Here in Israel and the former Soviet Union, the Jewish people are living in very difficult times. There are now thousands of destitute elderly Jews who are desperately in need of basic food. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is on the ground with survival food boxes, but the need for food is growing. Call or go online now and say, I will bless these children of Abraham. It's the elderly widows who are hurting the most. Many of them are also Holocaust survivors who are once again crying out for help. Their need, as you can see, is extremely urgent. Right now, you can give a gift of life of $25 that will help rush an emergency food box to an elderly Jewish person who doesn't have enough to eat. When you call right now, your gift's impact will be doubled to help save lives. For over 35 years, this trusted ministry has given Christians like me a way to tangibly bless Jewish people who are in need throughout the world. Wherever in the world the Jewish people have the greatest need, our spiritual mandate is to feed the hungry and to care for the widows and orphans. This is for you. Awesome. Together, we bring them Shalom. comfort and love but just as important, we bring them this life-saving food box. When you call right now, your gift's impact will be doubled to help save lives. Without your response, their pain and suffering will continue. Call or go online now and say, I will save a life. I will bless and comfort the Jewish people. A suicide bombing at a Shia mosque in Afghanistan has left over 100 dead and wounded. That's according to what the United Nations Mission to Afghanistan wrote on Twitter this morning. Local authorities say the explosion took place inside a mosque in the northern Afghan city of Kunduz. The UN Assistance Mission described the attack as part of a disturbing pattern of violence in the country. Earlier this week, ISIS-K claimed responsibility for Sunday's attack on a Kabul mosque. But no group has claimed responsibility for today's attack in Kunduz so far. If confirmed, a death toll of dozens would be the highest since U.S. and NATO forces left Afghanistan at the end of August. A Saudi wealth fund now owns Newcastle United Soccer Club after months of disputes, the main one being whether the Saudi kingdom would be able to control them. But on Thursday, the 128-year-old English club got legal assurance from the kingdom that they wouldn't. The English Premier League's Newcastle United has been acquired by Saudi Arabia's multi-billion dollar sovereign wealth fund. Fans welcomed the announcement on Thursday outside the club's home stadium, St. James Park. The long-running takeover saga brought an end to owner Mike Ashley's deeply unpopular reign over what most saw as a lack of investment in Newcastle. The deal was said to be worth 305 million pounds or about 415 million dollars. 
Now owned by the Saudi-led consortium, Newcastle will become one of the world's richest clubs. Saudi Arabia has increasingly sought high-profile sports assets, venturing into Formula One racing and heavyweight boxing. Human rights groups, however, have remained wary, condemning what they call Riyadh's efforts to distract from its human rights record. Saudi Arabia's government has denied allegations of human rights abuses, saying it is protecting national security from extremists. Sumo wrestling originated in Japan and is the country's national sport. However, the United States is now the home of one of the fastest growing fan bases and the largest annual tournament outside of Japan. NTD's Jason Blair has more. Sumo wrestling is all about big. It's big in Japan and is now getting bigger in the U.S. USA Sumo has been ramming, slapping, and slamming the sport in the people's hearts across the country. The fun of being able to do something that's not only entertaining for everyone, but it also is a cultural learning experience. They hold tournaments, events, and demonstrations all over the country. From fun and interactive events like their Sumo Sushi Show, to world-class competitions like the U.S. Sumo Open, which just held its 21st annual tournament in Los Angeles on Saturday. And actually, the U.S. Sumo Open is the largest annual sumo competition in the world outside of Japan. It's also the longest running annual sumo competition in the world outside of Japan. The competition attracts participants from all over the world. It has a men's and women's division with different weight classes, including open weight. Andrew Freund first started the organization by offering sumo classes, which is something that continues to this day. Every single week we have practices here in LA. I've been doing these, like I said, for almost 25 years. The head coach is Japanese two-time world champion Yamamoto Yama, also known as Yama. To be able to work with Yama has been amazing too. Um, for the last eight years, he is the heaviest Japanese sumo wrestler ever. Yama weighs in at 600 pounds and also participates in many of the organization's demonstrations and shows. He's been featured in movies like John Wick 2 and Ocean's 13, as well as music videos with artists like Ed Sheeran. Other wrestlers in the organization have attracted attention in the entertainment industry as well. So in the past 25 years or so, we've worked on about a thousand or actually over a thousand different TV shows, movies, commercials. USA Sumo hits the road again soon with their next events slamming their way into Miami and Seattle. Jason Blair, NTD News, California. We Earthlings are sitting ducks if an asteroid ever hurdles toward the planet, but NASA wants to change that. The agency plans to conduct its first test for a planetary defense system the day before Thanksgiving. That's when the agency will launch a SpaceX Falcon rocket from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, aimed at an over 500-foot-long asteroid named Dimorphos. It's currently orbiting a larger asteroid called Didymos, about 6.8 million miles away. NASA wants to see if it can change Dimorphos' orbit by crashing the rocket into it. If it works, the idea is this kinetic impactor technique could be used to change the course of any space rock that threatens Earth. NASA plans to use a satellite to record the impact and stream the test on its app and website, NASA TV. The 2018 rescue of a Thai soccer team from a flooded cave is being told in the new documentary entitled The Rescue. The film is set for release on October 8th. Entity's Andrew Thomas reports. On June 23rd, 2018, a group of 12 boys and their soccer coach went to explore the Tom Luang Cave Complex in Thailand, unaware that rising flood water after heavy rain would soon trap them. The ensuing international rescue effort received intense media focus across the globe. I think like many people around the world at the time, like we were living through a pretty tricky political moment in the world. And here was a story that kind of united us. Like we could all empathize as parents or as children. And the ups, the downs, the, I mean, the whole thing. So I think initially it was like, you know, it was parents of Asian children that we were transfixed. Four days into the rescue operation, British cave divers Richard Stanton and John Volenthin and British caver Robert Harper arrived to help. The whole aim was to create a, uh, a, a story, you know, recreate our story to show what we got went through in Thailand, and, and this is, you know, the accumulation of that, that, and we're bringing it to the general public. So that's exactly what why we signed up for this feature. 
Academy Award-winning directors and producers E. Chai Vassarelli and Jimmy Chin used never-before-seen footage of the rescue to help bring audiences inside the mission. British cave diver and rescuer John Volenthin described the immersive nature of the documentary. The movie itself is very powerful, it's, it's very emotional. It's hard not to watch the movie and to feel the fear uh, and the danger that the boys were in. Vassarelli and Chin described how the mission brought people together. That's the essence of the, of the story of the rescue, is that people from disparate backgrounds came together, irregardless of where you're from, what language you spoke, volunteer or professional, you came together to save children you've never met. After 17 days, the boys and their coach were all rescued safely. The cave is now off limits to the public. The film will be released in theaters October 8th. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Daniel Craig may be saying goodbye as James Bond, but his iconic Aston Martin is about to be given a new lease on life. A company is giving the classic car a modern update. The classic car is getting electrified. It's not exactly the model Bond drives in the movie, but the engine update allows the old car to drive on modern roads and conform to growing car emission requirements. The founder of an electrification specialist company says the car has a kind of beauty you will never find in a modern car. The DB6 model was first unveiled in 1965 and is considered the epitome of British auto style. Bond drives a DB5 in movies. The electric powertrain will give the car a range of 255 miles. The specialist already electrifies a number of prestigious old model cars from Rolls-Royce, Bentley and Jaguar and expects to expand to more Aston Martin models. Prices on Aston Martin updates are expected to exceed $1 million. Organic food is getting more popular, and with good reason. Today we look at some of the reasons eating organic could be a good idea. Here's Gina Murray who brings us Strong Mind and Body. Welcome to Strong Mind and Body, I'm Gina Marie. Eating organic isn't a fad. In fact, a 2019 US government report stated that sales from organic farms reached almost 10 billion. That's a 31% increase over about four years. Whether you are avoiding pesticides, looking for a healthier diet, or concerned about the environment, there is no shortage of reasons to eat organic foods. Here are six reasons to go organic. Number one, environmental health. According to entomologist David Pimentel, it's estimated that only 0.1% of applied pesticides reach the target pests. The bulk of pesticides, in other words 99%, are left to impact the environment. Waterways and farmland are contaminated by chemical runoffs from farms. Arguably, one of the largest environmental disasters has been the loss of quality soil. Number two, safe drinking water. The more chemicals applied per acre, the greater the challenge in preserving water quality. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is an area of low oxygen that can kill fish and marine life. It's the most graphic example of the enormous harm caused by farm chemicals flow off from millions of acres congregate in the mighty Mississippi. So not only is chemically dependent agriculture damaging our drinking water, it's also harming our waterways and oceans. Number three, health risks. It should be no surprise that the chemical pesticides that kill off pests are also causing harm to your health. Pesticides ingested by pregnant women has been linked to birth defects and deformities. Studies have also shown that some herbicides and pesticides stimulate the growth of breast cancer cells. By eating organic, you will dramatically reduce the amount of pesticide residue you ingest on a daily basis. This reduces your risk for diseases. Number four, biodiversity. The decline of birds, bees and other pollinators has been linked to the synthetic pesticides used by conventional farmers. Organic farms are home to around 30% more wildlife species than conventional farms. What's more, conventional foods in the past 20 years are produced using genetically engineered seeds. Number five, nutrition. Plants nurtured by healthy soil on organic farms produce crops that often contain higher levels of important antioxidants, minerals and vitamins. 
A team led by a Washington State University researcher also found organic milk contains significantly higher concentrations of heart-healthy fatty acids. This is compared to milk from cows on conventionally managed dairy farms. Organic farming is viewed as regenerative agriculture and can actually increase the fertility of the soil, creating more nutritious food. And number six, animal welfare. Livestock raised organically must have access to the outdoors and room enough to move, graze and develop in a manner that supports their natural behaviour. These animals can't be given growth hormones and animals treated with antibiotics can't produce organic products. Organically raised livestock have access to graze on grass and aren't fed a diet of GMO corn, cottonseed, canola and soy. To avoid illnesses and put a stop to inhumane treatment, purchase certified organic animal products. Thanks for watching. At NTD, we're honored to be your source for the news. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. Before you go, here's something you should know. Don't forget you can catch all of NTD's programs on television. NTD Business premieres live Mondays through Fridays at 5 p.m. We broadcast to many of your favorite platforms, Apple TV and Roku, for example. We're also rapidly growing on cable, satellite, and over the air all across the United States. Just go to ntd.com TV, type in your zip code, and find all the ways you can watch NTD.